been a while since I've had a stats video, so this one's a three month extravaganza, all rolled into one, about my home battery and solar stats. The light and long days mean that this is the best time of the year for solar generation, and even improved EV range with the warmer weather as well. For my April stats, I discussed how close I was to Octopus paying me for the month, despite having my electric vehicle and paying for a chunk of gas and electricity on top as well. In the end, my bill was around £30 for the month of April. Let's see how the next three months fare. Stay tuned to find out. Hi everyone, I'm Danny V Solar, and on this channel you can follow my journey all things electric vehicles, solar, renewables, energy tariffs and much more. Please subscribe to follow my journey and like this video if you find it useful. As a reminder of my setup, I have 16 panels. I have 10 on my west facing roof and 6 on the east facing roof. And that equates to give me a total array size of 6.32 kilowatts peak. I also combined that with a 9.5 kilowatt hour Gen 2 Give Energy battery and also the Give Energy 5 kilowatt hybrid inverter Gen 1. I drive a Tesla Model 3 performance and I charge that up on the cheap rate overnight on the Octopus Intelligent Go tariff and I currently have a gas boiler although I am looking to replace this at some point with a heat pump as well. If you like what you hear in this video and you'd like to join Octopus as well, it would be great if you could use the referral code that's on screen now. If you use this and join Octopus, you'll get £50 when you join and I also get £50 as well, which helps to support the channel. Let's start by looking at the generation across the three months. For May, we generated a total, as you can see on screen now, of 629 kilowatt hours. And that was up from the 518 kilowatt hours that we generated in April, as you would expect. As usual, most of this was exported back to the grid, earning 15 pence per kilowatt hour on the Octopus outgoing export tariff. And that's combined with the Intelligent Octopus Go tariff that I use. And I then try and import most of my energy on the cheap overnight rate of 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour to charge my electric vehicle and home battery to keep the costs low. As of the 1st of July as well, the cheap overnight rate on the Intelligent Octopus Go tariff actually dropped from 7.5 pence per kilowatt hour to 7 pence per kilowatt hour, and that makes charging my home battery and electric vehicle even cheaper again. For June, again, we had an improvement and we just pipped 800 kilowatt hours for the month for generation. June has been the best month of generation now for two years running, and that's when the sun's highest in the sky. Really works well with my east west facing array. And although this was a big jump on May's figures, it was actually down versus last year's generation. As expected, July's generation dropped off again from June and we only generated 670 kilowatt hours. I say only generated, this is still way more than I would use in a month, even charging my electric vehicle as well. And we actually had some nice days towards the end of July and that helped to push the generation up. Interestingly, solar to the home was around 100 kilowatt hours for all three months, so pretty consistent and not much of that solar going from the solar panels to the battery at this time of the year because of the way we use the octopus tariffs. This next graph always provides a nice comparison for the annual generation. May was low compared to last year due to the poor summer that we had early on in the year and generated only 83% versus the generation last year. June was 5% down on last year, so getting quite close in the end. And July was pretty much bang on with the same period last year. So we have thankfully had a bit of a summer in the end and hopefully that continues throughout August as well. I always also map this graph as well, which shows the best day for generation, the worst day for generation, and the monthly average for each month. And I expect this to be more consistent than it actually is proven. And we've had quite a few outliers in the data versus last year. With how bad May was, we've had a new low for May and a low high, if that makes sense. And the average was four kilowatt hours down versus last year. Interestingly, in June, the highs and lows were compressed a little. The lowest generation day in June was 13 kilowatt hours, but the highest was only 37 kilowatt hours. So not once did we hit 40 kilowatt hours like we did a couple of times last year. July again came in pretty comparable to last year's figures. The 1st of June was the best day's generation for the whole of the three months. And even in this, you can see where due to the cloud cover, we could have had even more improvements. When the sun was fully shining though, we had a peak generation of 5.27 kilowatts and the battery barely dipped below 100% all day. Interestingly, the continual sunny days actually caused me some problems with the battery as we moved into the warmer months. I'll talk about that later on in the video, but I did have to adjust my setup slightly to cater for this. 
Looking at the lowest day for generation, this was in May and we only generated a measly 2.8 kilowatt hours. Now the only time in the last two years where we've had a day as bad as that was back in March. From what I remember, this was a typical grey British day, which we didn't see much generation all day, topping out at just 780 watts, which is very poor for me. If we move on to look at grid import, May and June's import was relatively low. May was 61 kilowatt hours for the month and 51 kilowatt hours for June. But July is when this all changed, and this is when my import leaps up to 188 kilowatt hours for the month. And this is because of the issue that I mentioned earlier. Because basically I was topping the battery up full every night and then the solar was keeping the battery topped up full all day, it was rarely getting below 80% state of charge. And this can cause all sorts of calibration issues for the battery or an SOC problem as you may hear it referred to. And this occurred on the 10th of July. Because the battery doesn't get to a low enough state of charge, it struggles more and more as time goes on to understand how full it actually is. And when this happened on mine, the battery dropped to 0%. And I just happened to notice it when it did, as it started pulling a lot of power from the grid all of a sudden. It then charged back up to 100% and seemed to be fine afterwards. But I did change my setup after this point. So I now export the battery back to the grid on a daily basis, starting at around about 9pm. And that's until the cheap window starts at 11.30pm. And this drops the battery down to about 40% each day. And I keep that 40% in the battery just to ensure it doesn't drop any lower than this to give me enough to see me through the night until it can charge up again at 11.30pm. And this has a couple of benefits. This keeps the battery state of charge happy so it always knows how full it actually is. And we also earn a little bit more from the export that we send back to the grid at the 15 pence per kilowatt hour rate. It does mean that the battery has to top up more during the night but as this is only on the 7 pence per kilowatt hour rate it doesn't make too much difference. And if we move on to look at home consumption, this remained pretty consistent throughout the three months, about the norm for the rest of the year, apart from the deep winter months. So 159 kilowatt hours for May, 157 kilowatt hours for June, and 180 kilowatt hours for July. Now don't forget this thing excludes EV usage, which I'll come on to next. And you might notice this spike on the 20th of July there, and that confused me a little for a while. But then I remembered it was actually my one-year-old's birthday party and we had a bouncy castle in the garden all day. So that's what caused that spike there. And that accounted for around 10 to 12 additional kilowatt hours of usage on that day. And if we move on to EV usage, and yet again, we've had some troubles with the Zappy connecting to the Wi-Fi. This means that it hasn't been talking to Octopus either and it's struggled to map the smart charges for the car. So the last month or so, I've essentially had it charging in the standard hours between 11.30pm and 5.30am for the past couple of months. I need to do some work on this to see if I can move the router closer or do something to help maintain the connection. But as you can see, the usage for May was 183 kilowatt hours. The usage for June was 172 kilowatt hours and July was 222 kilowatt hours. So this is a little bit lower than what the norm has been, and that's a combination of the warm weather playing a part in making the car more efficient and getting more miles from the battery in the warmer weather. And also there's a couple of holidays in May as well, and into June that kept the usage low. Grid export now, so again, quite high. Most of the solar generation going back to the grid Within May, that was 532 kilowatt hours. June was 694 kilowatt hours. And then in July, 664 kilowatt hours. And you can see the change there from the 10th of July when I had the state of charge issue. I then changed my usage patterns and you can see more going back from the battery to the grid on that nighttime period when I'm sending everything back to the grid just to keep that state of charge issue under control. And if we move on to look at the payback, I'm not going to go through every single one of these figures, but as you can see, the savings, if I didn't have solar, versus the flexible rate was £112.19 for May, £136.98 for June, and £123.82 for July. So if we add that to our cumulative savings, we're over £2,000 now, just in the savings versus the flexible tariff, which I would have been on if I wasn't on this tariff that I'm on now with my electric vehicle. Car usage, as we mentioned, costing me very little on Intelligent Octopus Go, so £14.86 for May, £13.38 for June, and just £16.83 for July. 
And that equates to a saving of around about £150 per month on my fuel costs as well. And although I can't attribute that directly to the solar install, I do like to include this saving as well on my, my payback. So you can see those figures there if you want to take a closer look. So onto the bills for May, June and July. Standing charge has gone up during this period, so we're now paying £21.42 during May. It's around about 69 pence per day in the northeast. Hopefully they can do something to revamp that structure for standing charges and make it a bit fairer for everyone. My electricity charge was £19.86 for the month and they exported back around about £80. Gas standing charge has also gone up a little but not too bad, so £9.15 for that and then a charge of £5.33. So that meant a total bill for the month of May for minus £24.19 which is pretty incredible considering that I'm charging my electric vehicle, charging my battery on at night, and I'm also using a little bit of gas there to heat my hot, hot water and cook on the hob as well. For June, similar sort of story, so minus £54.23 was the total for June, and that was a combination of £17.42 in electricity usage, £3.58 for gas, and earning £104.21 for exports. And if we look at July, the, again, standard charge, £21.42, uh, electricity charge of £31.13, again, export of around about £100 for the month of July, and the gas usage was just £3.07, equating to minus £34.84 for the month of July. So if we look across the three months, that's a total energy bill of minus £113.26 which I think is pretty fantastic when you consider what I'm getting for that money. Hopefully you found this video useful. As always, I provide real world data from my system, as you can see it direct as it's coming from the Give Energy portal and my Octopus bills. Hopefully that helps and hopefully it encourages you to make positive decisions on renewables and energy tariffs with Octopus. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.